So, so this guy, he's a character, which I think is why he's starting to become famous. He's been put in a lot of textbooks here in our country. Um, but he, his wife committed suicide, and he, was, he went swimming in a cold lake, which is a European, Asian thing. Um, like Russia, it's very common to go ice dipping. Um, Americans, like, mm, no, give me a heater and a jacuzzi. Like, I'll get in a jacuzzi in the winter. Uh, but it is common in some countries for them to go into cold water. And he, when he went into the water, of course, you start breathing. It's like he teaches in his meditative breathing. That's how the ice water makes you breathe anyways. So he started to develop this, like, cold thing, and he, he just felt better. Because, of course, he's dealing with this tremendous depression from losing his wife in such a horrible way. And it made him feel better. So he kept going into the water, and eventually it helped him to get over the health, uh, the mental health issues. And he also started physically becoming healthier, more energetic, more happy, and so on. So he's done things like he's climbed Everest, not completely, but I think up to the second base camp, I think, um, which is like even getting to first base camp, you're that's a good, like you've done well. And he did second in his shorts. Um, he has, like you saw, he swam under icebergs in the Antarctic, which most people would not last very long, and he has lasted a long time. Um, he's also, he also ran a marathon in Namibia in the heat, I think it was Namibia, uh, without any water, and he was fine. So he has developed this ability to control his body, and I'm sure his brown fat level is really high, really high which gives him tons of energy, makes him feel well. His body's producing all the right chemicals it needs because it has the right amount of brown fat and a low amount of white fat. So, obviously very healthy. And he has taught other people to do this, and it's been proven by research. It's not just him. This is a technique anybody can do. And if you look at other cultures, there's many that do ice cold shock therapy. Um, there are Buddhist monks who practice this. They'll sit in the snow and meditate and they have developed a technique to control their metabolic processes so they can keep their temperature up, so they're not cold when they're in the snow. Um, I'm part Indian, and my tribe, it was a coming of age ritual, where starting, I think it was when a boy was 13, starting in summer, he would have to jump into a river, and then go down to the bottom, pull up mud and to prove he'd been to the bottom, and then walk naked back to the village, which was a good distance. And this would continue until the dead of winter. And this tribe was the East Coast, so not like California winter. It was a really cold winter. And so every single day they were training their body to handle the cold. And after that, it was believed, now you were a warrior because you can control your body heat and you could keep yourself warm in any situation. So it is something that we can do. Um, I cannot do it. Um, <laughs> try a few cold showers. does not last long. Um, but it is something that is physiological, physiologically pro possible, which is just... It's amazing. And obviously it's healthy for you because you get that brown fat production. So the more you expose yourself to cold showers, per se, yeah. the more fat. Um, yes, the brown more brown fat. fat. Because your body says, well, if, I'm, if we're cold, we need to produce more brown fat so you stay warm. Yeah. So that's one way, without exercising, one way that you could make your body healthier. Ice showers. What was that? Could you do ice packs? Probably. I don't know how, I mean, unless you did, like, a lot of ice like he's doing. I don't know how much that would create cold shock, but it would probably do a little bit. Yeah. But it doesn't, it doesn't take over the white fat, even if you're doing... You know, the more, the theory is the more brown fat you have, the you start to sort of spiral back the other direction. So it'll start making all the metabolic, metabolic processes healthier. And then that would naturally lead, like a side effect would be lower white body fat. So that's why a lot of athletes take ice baths. Yes, that, well, swelling too, because it's good for inflammation, mm -hmm. which is a big part of the whole weight loss sort of thing, right? Less inflammation. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's also, you can buy or rent, you can pay to go into a, um, I don't know what they call it, it's basically a free the walk in freezer. Mm -hmm. but it's, mm -hmm. Yeah, that might be what it's called, where you just walk into it, mm -hmm. and it's like negative 30 degrees or something. And obviously that's a huge shock, cold shock to your system. And the result, if you consistently do that, is more brown fat, more mitochondria, you feel better. Do more energy, how, less depression. Yeah. Do you know how consistent you have to be to like actually start producing it, or you're telling me that's unfair? I've never done it, so. Yeah, I know. Um, 
I don't know. I, I would think one time is going to have some effect. I don't know how big of an effect it is. Um, one person I know who does this, he does it once a week, but he's also an athlete, so I don't know that a regular person would need that. It's probably also independent, like individual to, to who the person is, like how often you need to do it. But I think once a week would probably be more than enough. Um, Wim Hof suggests at minimum that when you take a cold shower, you just turn it on to cold for like a minute. Um, I can't last a minute. But, but you could start with just like a burst of cold and turn it back to hot. And even that's going to start producing some brown fat in your body, and then you'll get more and more used to it. He does also have like a training program, and he has an app and everything now. Um, he's becoming totally commercial, which is good for him. But yeah. So, so when they're in the water, the breathing technique helps to build more brown fat. So do they do they feel the cold, or just over time it becomes numb? Over time, um, he has he has the ability, and his students also has the ability to raise their body temperature. So he can somehow activate all the processes in the body that produce heat. So then it starts to feel warm after? Yes. Oh. So his body temperature literally rises. And even when he's not cold, he could sit there and you could measure his temperature rising if he wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is crazy, right? <laughs> yeah. It's totally crazy. Mm -hmm. um, he's also, he has said for years that he can also control his immune system. And so they did an experiment. This is a peer-reviewed journal. So this is like real scientists doing this. They gave people E. coli to make them sick. This is real. And half of them were trained by him, I would really hope if I was in that, that I would be trained by him because they did not get sick. Whereas the other half of the group did get extremely sick. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, and there's other things like um, Romanian gypsies were known to be able to control their heart rate. So they could consciously, they could make their heart rate drop. And there is, there's stories in the past of them killing themselves that way, like if they were imprisoned or something. So, yeah, it's amazing the control that we actually can have over our bodies if we're trained with it. So, um, let's see, I think that's pretty much, yeah. By the way, heat shock also works, so if you take a, um, like if you go into a sauna, I think it has to be above 130 degrees, so we don't quite get it in our everyday life here. If you live in Palm Springs, you probably get natural heat shock. Alright, um, so the other thing, brown fat is shown to be protective against Obesity, so this is the cycle I was talking about where um, the more brown fat you have, it creates sort of this ca cascade to lower uh, white fat cells. Um, and it also helps with aging. So they did some studies on rats where they decreased brown fat levels or increased them, depending on which rat you are. So rats with low levels of brown fat were more likely to be obese, more likely to be insulin resistant, and more likely to have heart issues. Those that they had without any brown fat had, the, this was a quote from the study, the worst osteoporosis they had ever seen. Okay, so if you have osteoporosis, get a sauna or take a cold shower and it might actually help to um, alleviate that. Or for us younger people, it might help to protect you from getting osteoporosis down the road. Um, those with higher levels of brown fat maintained lower body weights and had superior health as they aged, which is what I would hope people would say about me as I aged, okay? <laughs> Dietary restriction increased brown fat activity and protected organs and the nervous system against age-related dysfunction and degeneration. What is dietary restriction? Intermittent fasting, okay? Uh, so if you fast, that will also increase your brown fat. If you do keto, that mimics fasting. It's not quite as good as actually fasting but it mimics fasting in the body, and you also have an increase in brown fat, which is why a lot of people who do keto say they feel amazing eating that way. Okay, so you do want to be fat. You just want to have the right type of fat, okay? Um, okay, so we already talked about um, uh, cold shock. Um, interestingly, you are born with the most brown fat you'll ever have, so newborns have the most brown fat. It's really interesting, huh? Um, controlling your blood sugar will help with it, so the, it's, everything is just sort of cycling back and forth, it's, it's this combination stuff. So if you have more brown fat, it will help control your blood sugar. But if you control your blood sugar, that will also help you to produce more brown fat. Um, a study in mice found that there is actually a sort of like a sub 
type of brown fat. Um, and it tends to be interspersed in the white fat. And this can be created by exercise. Okay? So exercise creates a release of a hormone called ursin. Um, and that helps the body to create uh, brown fat. Which is why, why exercise also eventually will lead to energy. Unless you have an autoimmune disease, then <laughs> it doesn't matter how much you exercise. Does anybody in here have an autoimmune issue? Nobody? This is the first time I think I've ever had a class where nobody had an autoimmune disease. It's amazing. Not that I know of. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep hoping for the best. <laughs> All right. Um, another study showed that a certain protein switch determines if fat cells will develop into brown or white, and this is believed to be controlled epigenetically. So that means you may just be born lucky, and you just naturally have more brown fat. Your body naturally produces more, and that's all there is to it. However, epigenetics also means the way you live your lifestyle can change your genetic code. So again, you eat like crap, you have high blood sugar, that may actually go into your DNA and switch off certain snips of your genetic code and cause your... your great healthy body that was producing brown fat to stop making it or stop making as much of it. And conversely, if you're unhealthy and you start eating healthily, you may be able to turn on those epigenetics so that you start to produce more brown fat. Okay? So remember, just because somebody says, well, it's genetic, doesn't actually mean it's the end of the story. You guys have learned about epigenetics, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not confusing. I had one person say it. Anybody else? No. Okay. Okay. This is a good, this is a good lesson to know. Um, let me see, I'm not a rat in here. So, epi, does anybody know what the Latin root word epi, or something, prefix, whatever, stands for? Above. Above, okay? So, these are the genetics above the genetics. So, we used to believe DNA, genetics was destiny, that's all there is to it. Um, that's why Hitler did what he did. But now we know that <laughs> genetics are not... Um, yeah, I'm terrible with not being politically correct. <laughs> Genetics are not the end of the story. I can't believe I've never had a complaint about that. Um, I always say, sometimes teaching, it, you feel like you've been possessed by something because things are coming out of your mouth that you have no control over. Anyhow, so you have your genetics, your T, C's, and G's, and everything. Um, but on top of this, um, if you look at your DNA, it's not just these smooth little spirals. They're actually rolled up, so it's like if you had, um, I don't remember, I'm not an artist. It's like if you had a, a sewing spindle, like a sewing thread spindle. Have you guys, anybody sew? Okay. And the DNA is actually wrapped around that. Okay, so you have a bunch of these with your DNA right, wrapped around it. The tighter they're wrapped, the less easy they are to access, which is good if it is a DNA SNP for breast cancer, right? You really don't want that part of your genetics turned on. So the, the, more, the more dense it is or the more tight it is, the less able your body is to go through and read that DNA and activate it. If it's loose, then now you can go through all the DNA and you can activate it. So if it's the DNA for brown fat, then yeah, you want that to be activated. Now, there are um, something we call methyl groups that will go through and will either tighten or loosen parts of your DNA. Um, and I don't know how they know, but they tighten the bad stuff and they loosen the good stuff. Does anybody know where we get methyl groups from? You have a guess? Go for it. Well, I was going to say alcohol, but it's not. No, definitely. <laughs> alcohol. I don't know that alcohol, well, maybe red wine might. I'm not sure. Um, but it's mostly green vegetables. Some fruit will also give you methyl groups. Spinach is great for methylation. Um, so the healthier you eat, the more methyl groups you have. By the way, high blood sugar and high insulin, what do you think it does to methyl groups? Decreases, Decreases it. Uh -huh. So the more methyl groups you have, the better your DNA is going to be. Now, however, you're, and this is, it doesn't like come and go. It attaches and stays that way until maybe you run out of methyl groups and you start becoming deficient in um, methyl groups. So as long as you maintain a healthy lifestyle, it will stay attached to the DNA and keep the DNA how it is. Which also means when you have babies, guess what you pass down to them? Your epigenetics. So the healthier you are, the healthier your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren will be. We, de we usually see um, an effect to the fourth generation. Okay. 
Um, so that means if you eat well, but your children and your grandchildren eat bad, your great-grandchildren will still have benefits from you. So it's important. You're not just affecting your children. Um, since you haven't learned about this, let me pull up a good video. You ever notice that if you get to know two identical twins, they might look alike, but they're always subtly different? Yeah. Whatever. As they get older, those differences can get more pronounced. Two people start out the same, but their appearance and their health can diverge. For instance, you have more gray hair. No, no, I don't. Identical twins have the same DNA, the exact same genes. Yeah. And don't our genes make us who we are? Well, they do, yes, but they're not the whole story. Some researchers have discovered a new bit of biology that can work with our genes or against them. Yeah. You're heavier and I'm better looking. Yeah. Whatever. Imagine coming into the world with a person so like yourself that for a time you don't understand mirrors. As a child, when I looked in the mirror, I'd say, that's my sister. And my mother would say, no, that's your reflection. And even if you resist this cookie-cutter existence, cultivate individual styles and abilities like cutting your hair differently or running faster. Uncanny similarities bond you together. Facial expressions. Body language. The way you laugh. Or dress for an interview, perhaps, when you hadn't a clue what your sister was going to wear. The synchrony in your lives constantly confronts you. When I see my sister, I see myself. If she looks good, I think I look pretty today. But if she's not wearing makeup, I say, my God, I look horrible. It's hardly surprising, because you both come from the same egg. You have precisely the same genes. And you're literally clones, better known as identical twins. But now, imagine this. One day, your twin, your clone, is diagnosed with cancer. Por favor. If you're the other twin, what can you do except wait for the symptoms? I have been told that I am a high risk for cancer. Damocles sword hangs over me. And yet, it's not uncommon for a twin like Anna Marie to get a dread disease, while the other, like Clotilde, doesn't. But how can two people so alike be so unalike? Well, these mice may hold a clue. Their DNA is as identical as Anna Marie and Clotilde's despite the differences in their color and size. The human who studies them is Duke University's Randy Jertle. So Randy, I see here you have skinny mice and fat mice. What have you done in this lab? Well, these animals are actually genetically identical. The fat ones and the skinny ones? That's correct. Because these are huge. They're huge. Uh, can we weigh them to find sure. out? So if you take this is looks like they can barely walk. They they then can't walk too much. They're not going to be running very far. So that's so about sixty three grams. Sixty three grams. Let's look at the other one. So it's half the weight. Right. This gets even more mysterious when you realize that these identical mice both have a particular gene called agouti, but in the yellow mouse it stays on all the time, causing obesity. <laughs> Just look at this. So what accounts for the thin mouse? Exercise? Atkins? No. A tiny chemical tag of carbon and hydrogen called a methyl group has affixed to the agouti gene, shutting it down. Living creatures possess millions of tags like these. Some, like methyl groups, attach to genes directly, inhibiting their function. Other types grab the proteins, called histones, around which genes coil, 
and tighten or loosen them to control gene expression. Distinct methylation and histone patterns exist in every cell, constituting a sort of second genome, the epigenome. Epigenetics literally translates into just meaning above the genome. So if you would think, for example, of the genome as being like a computer, the hardware of, the, of, of a computer, the epigenome would be like the software that tells the computer when to work, how to work, and how much. In fact, it's the epigenome that tells our cells what sort of cells they should be. Skin, hair, heart, you see, all these cells have the same genes, but their epigenomes silence the unneeded ones to make cells different from one another. Epigenetic instructions pass on as cells divide, but they're not necessarily permanent. Researchers think they can change, especially during critical periods like puberty or pregnancy. Schertl's mice reveal how the epigenome can be altered. To produce thin brown mice instead of fat yellow ones, he feeds pregnant mothers a diet rich in methyl groups to form the tags that can turn genes off. And I think you can see that we dramatically shifted the coat color and we get many, many more brown animals. And that matters because your coat color is a tracer. It's, it's an indicator. That's correct. Of the the fact that you have turned off that gene. That's right. This epigenetic fix was also inherited by the next generation of mice, regardless of what their mothers ate. And when an environmental toxin was added to the diet instead of nutrients, more yellow babies were born, doomed to grow fat and sick like their mothers. It seems to me this has profound implications for our health. It does for human health if there are genes like this in humans. Basically, what you eat can affect your future generations. So you're not only what you eat, potentially what your mother ate, and possibly even what your grandparents ate. So how do you go to humans to do this experiment when you have these mice and they're genetically identical on purpose? That's so right. So who is your perfect lab human? Well, then we look for identical humans, which are identical twins. 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 And that brings us to the reason why we're showing you Spanish twins. In 2005, they participated in a groundbreaking study in Madrid. Its aim? To show just how identical, epigenetically, they are or aren't. One of the questions of twins is that if my twin has this disease, I will have the same disease. And genetics uh, tell us that there is a high risk of developing the same disease, but it's not really uh, sure they're going to have it, because our genes are just part of the story. Something has to regulate these genes. And part of the explanation is epigenetics. Estella wanted to see if the twins' epigenomes might account for their differences. To find out, he and his team collected cells from 40 pairs of identical twins, age 3 to 74. Then began the laborious process of dissolving the cells until all that was left were wispy strands of DNA, the master molecule that contains our genes. Next, researchers amplified fragments of the DNA until the genes themselves became detectable. Those that had been turned off epigenetically appear as dark pink bands on the gel. Now, Notice what happens when the genes from a pair of twins are cut out and overlapped. The results are far from subtle, especially when you compare the epigenomes of two sets of twins that differ in age. Here on the left is the overlapped DNA of six-year-old Javier and Carlos. The yellow indicates where their gene expression is identical. On the right is the DNA of 66-year-old Anna Marie and Clotilde. In contrast to the younger twins, hardly any yellow shines through. Their epigenomes have changed dramatically. 
The study suggests that as twins age, epigenetic differences accumulate, especially when their lifestyles differ. One of the main findings of our research is that epigenomes can change in function of what we eat, of what we smoke, or what we drink. And this is one of the key uh, difference between epigenetics and genetics. You know? You know? As the chemical tags that control our genes change, cells can become abnormal, triggering diseases like cancer. Take a disorder like MDS, cancer of the blood and bone marrow. It's not a diagnosis you'd ever want to hear. When I went in, then he started patting my hand and he was going, your blood work does not look very good at all and that I had um, MDS leukemia and uh, that there was not a cure for it and basically I had six months uh, to live. Was epigenetics the reason? Could the silencing of critical genes turn normal cells into cancerous ones? It's scary to think that a few misplaced tags can kill you. But it's also good news, because we've traditionally viewed cancer as a disease stemming solely from broken genes. And it's a lot harder to fix damaged genes than to rearrange epigenetic tags. In fact, we already have a few drugs that will work. Recently, Sandra Shelby and Roy Cantwell participated in one of the first clinical trials using epigenetic therapy. The idea of epigenetic therapy is to stay away from killing the cell. Rather, what we are trying to do is diplomacy, trying to change the instructions of the cancer cells, reminding the cell hey, you're a human cell, you shouldn't be behaving this way. And we try to do that by reactivating genes. The results have been incredible. And I didn't have really any horrible side effects. I am in remission. And going in the plus direction is a whole lot better than the minus direction. In fact, half the patients in the trial are now in remission. But while it may be easier to fix our epigenome than our genome, messing it up is easier too. We've got to get people thinking more about what they do. They have a responsibility for their epigenome. Their genome they inherit, but their epigenome they potentially can alter, and particularly that of their children. And that brings in responsibility, but it also brings in hope. You're not necessarily stuck with this. You can alter this. So, um, I did 23andMe a few years ago, and I have the DNA for I have the DNA for ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, which is awful. But nobody in my family's ever had that, so hopefully our epigenetics are under control. I also have the DNA for red hair, so I thought hey, if I could only figure out how to eat enough <laughs> spinach to get red hair. That's great. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I think everybody should get that done. Not that I'm plugging 23andMe. I should be an affiliate marketer for them or something. But, um, <laughs> but it's really interesting to see what is in your DNA code. Like, I don't have the genetics for breast cancer. So I don't know if it's even possible for me to get that type of cancer, which is good news. I like that. Um, but it does tell you what you need to look out for. OK, um, let me see about this. So this is pretty. So everybody knows about the BMI, yeah. So there's a formula, you can tell whether you're obese or not. There are some issues with measuring your weight with the BMI. Um, there are some people who, let's see. Um, so like you have these, you have these two guys, right? They'll have the same BMI, even though one is super obese and the other one is super muscular. So BMI is not the best predictor for how healthy you are. Um, because they're the same height and the same weight, the BMI would say they have the same BMI, which obviously the guy on the left is doing better, assuming he's not on steroids. <laughs> which, by the way, steroids do totally throw off the BMI. So that's, that's another issue. It definitely was not designed 
for uh, measuring people with steroids. There's other ways to measure body fat. These are terrible skin fold methods, but um, also not the best way to do it, especially if you have an autoimmune disease with a lot of inflammation. Your skin will be very thick, and so it can be hard to pinch it. You can do the electrical thing. If you have a scale that does body fat, that's what it's doing. This is the, one of the best ways, at least for the cost of it. So body fat floats, fat floats. Um, which is why if you're eating too much body fat and you go to the bathroom, that also might float. Um, or not body fat. Well, yeah, body fat, just animal body fat, hopefully. Um, so you float the person, you see how much they float, and um, that can tell you what their body fat percentage is. And then also the air displacement is what they're measuring in the pod. pod. Um, so those are really cheap and good methods. The best way is uh, an actual scan of the body, which tells you exactly what the percentage is, is an x-ray scan, um, but it's really expensive. So, uh, most people who really want to know will do the bog pod. Yeah. Oh, let me just go through this. Okay, so we also, that video briefly talked about the fat distribution in the body. So you have the apple shape, you have the pear shape, okay? This is, you're talking about your waist to hip ratio. So how how, what's the diameter, the circumference of your, your waist versus the circumference of your hips. The smaller your waist is to your hips, the better you're doing. And that's the same for men and women, although women obviously have more of a dramatic um, difference. So that's the narrowest point between your ribs and your hip, and then the widest point of your hips is what you'd be measuring. Um, the bigger that ratio is for men, it's 0.96 is the ratio. For women, it's 0.84. Um, the, the, basically, the bigger that ratio is, the less healthy you are because of what that video said. Insulin likes to store fat on your belly. So you're going to have a bigger belly than you should. Um, now there are some women who are quite obese, but they still have a good waist to hip ratio. Um, and they're, they're not as unhealthy as those women with a bad waist to hip ratio, but um, there still are issues with that because they have found that the fat in your behind is also not the best fat. So belly fat, behind fat, um, those produce chemicals that can cause issues. <coughs> and that's also the bigger your butt is, the um, more that's associated with health issues. Now that's like, I'm not saying like you're a nice, healthy, skinny person um, and then you have to have a nice butt. Um, but if you are, if you're obese everywhere, even if you have a good waist to hip ratio, there's still an issue. All right, um, anybody have a good, nice button? No, okay, so um, it is three times more accurate at predicting heart disease risk than body mass index. So BMI is dumb. You should just measure your waist and hip and figure out what the ratio is. Yeah? What if it's not, not a significant difference between your waist and your hip? Then that would mean that you have a worse waist to hip ratio. Okay. So you want there to be significant difference. So you've got the picture of what's her face. What's her name? Is that Rihanna? Beyonce. Beyonce. Oh yeah, Beyonce. 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 <laughs> I'm tired. I knew that. I grew up with Destiny's Child. Um, <laughs> many studies have shown that men are more attractive with women with a good waist to hip ratio, which nobody's surprised about. Okay. Now they call that the pear shape, which I think is terrible. We used to call that the hourglass figure. Okay. Yeah. So it's not like you don't want to have a pear shape. That sounds terrible. But it's the same thing when we talk about an hourglass figure. Okay. You've got a decent chest. You've got a nice waist. You've got bigger hips. Okay. Look at any cartoon that men watch, and you will see that shape. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because it is. You watch a male cartoon and you have a much more extreme waist to hip ratio than a girl's cartoon. Yeah. Anyhow. Um, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we talked about all this. Okay, oh, this is the behind one. Okay, fat concentrated in the butt may also be a risk factor for metabolic syndrome, heart disease, type 2 diabetes. Okay, um, your behind fat actually creates a, chem a protein called Shemarin, um, which is associated with high blood pressure and low good cholesterol. Okay. But again, I mean, that's like an excessively, yeah, anyhow. We talked about visceral and subcutaneous fat already. I think that's probably pretty decent. Apple shape is most associated with visceral fat. So if you have that apple shape, um, then you will have more fat around your organs, which is not healthy. 
Although if you cook with fat, kidney fat is the best kind of fat for making a pie. There's a, just a factoid for you right there. Um, okay, so apple fat is also more apple fat. Apple, <laughs> apple shape. <laughs> I don't think apples have fat. Um, apple shape is more associated with the syndrome X, which we talk about obesity, high blood pressure, high triglyceride, um, low HDL cholesterol, which is the one you want, and insulin resistance. Okay, um, and it it's probably a side effect of having metabolic syndrome rather than a cause of. But again, like most things in the body, it starts to become a catch-22. So more abdominal fat will help to create more insulin resistance, which creates more abdominal fat. By the way, stress does the same thing, because what is cortisol's job in the body? Oh, this is interesting. Okay, this is a good one to teach about, too. Okay, we're getting all sorts of interesting information. Um, so cortisol is, you have your kidneys, right? And on top of your kidney is your adrenal gland. And cortisol will be released from the brain and go to the adrenal gland and cause the adrenal gland to release epinephrine or adrenaline. Okay. Epinephrine is the proper term in our country. Adrenaline is what they call it in like in Europe. Okay. So epi gets released, epi goes to the liver. That's, that's a liver. And what does liver do in, well, let me start with saying stress, right? Cortisol. And then epi from the adrenal glands. What does the liver have to do with stress? Important connection there. The glycosinolysis? Yes, okay. It releases insulin, or it releases sugar into the bloodstream. So if you, are, if a bear walks into this classroom, your cortisol levels will go through the roof, right? Okay, we had a bobcat on our farm last week, and uh, I got into our barn, killed a bunch of animals, which sucked. Um, but I walked in, seeing all the, my poor dead animals that I spent so much time raising, and all of a sudden I looked to the side, and there's a bobcat, right there. My body definitely released some cortisol, because those are dangerous animals. Cortisol went to my adrenal glands to release adrenaline, which went to my liver and released sugar. Why do we want sugar or glucose, I should say? Energy. Energy. Okay? So the, it, the liver contains this massive amount of sugar, of glucose, to release into the body to be produced into energy so that you can do a fight or flight response. If I needed to fight off that bobcat, even though I'm a weak sissy, I may have been able to do it because of that burst of energy from the liver. Yeah. <laughs> I turned and walked out of the barn, and it just sat there. I was really lucky. Yeah. yeah, it just sat there. Well, it, it was eating one of my geese. So, oh, wow. yeah. It killed 15 of them, fun. two peacocks, which I was really mad about. And then, um, yeah, it was sitting there eating a goose. Was it the white peacock? So, yes. No. My poor white peacock, my favorite peacock. Sad. That's my favorite peacock. Yeah. And these geese, they're an endangered breed, so we're breeding them for preservation, and they wiped out our entire flock. Yeah. So, yeah. So now I'm saying about getting bobcat taxidermy. <laughs> yeah. Which also sucked to have to shoot an animal like that. That sucks, right? But it was still killing our animals, so it's... And then, if you want to chase a bobcat out of the barn, feel free to do it, but I wasn't about to. But isn't that a terrible thing? Uh, I, I do an Airbnb on our ranch, and um, one of the guests... Their little girl opened the barn door. Yeah. That's why you close gates. And that's why you spank your bratty children. <laughs> Anyhow, um, <laughs> yeah, take my psychology class, we'll talk about the applied effects of spanking. But anyhow, <laughs> sugar goes to the muscles. But here's the thing you have a lot of sugar, and you only have so much yes. insulin floating around your body. So the other thing cortisol does is it goes to your pancreas and causes it to release a flood of insulin to help that flood of sugar get into your muscle cells immediately. So now you can fight off a mountain lion. Or um, like one scenario, this happened in Yukaipa, there was a big forest fire there a few years back, and there was a firefighter who got caught in the fire and he tried to outrun it to get to his car, which he did successfully get to his police car, and then he was able to get out of the fire. Now, they estimate that fire was probably going around 50 miles per hour. So he was able to run 50 miles per hour. Humans can't run 50 miles per hour. However, 
<laughs> With this huge release of sugar, sugar and insulin, we can do superhuman feats of strength. So you hear about like a little old grandma who lifts a car off of her kid. Um, or um, there's one story of, there's a guy um, fishing on a riverbank with his golden retriever. He had a stroke, fell into the river, and the dog pulled him out of the river, pulled him up the steep riverbank, and he worked so hard to do it, and must have had such an adrenaline rush doing this, that he literally ripped his thigh muscles away from the bone. That's how hard that dog was pulling. Okay? Yeah, awesome. That's the only two are good dogs. Annoying. Um, so, awesome system for short-term stress. If you need to outrun a lion, this is a great system. However, any of you just temporarily stressed out right now? You know, temporarily, it's going to be gone in, say, five minutes. Christmas. <laughs> That's what we call long-term stress. And then we have how many days off until school starts again and you're stressed out again? Like two weeks? It sucks. Yeah. And then you're long chronically stressed out. So you are all college students. You are chronically stressed. Which means your body is constantly releasing cortisol, constantly releasing insulin, and constantly releasing sugar from the liver. Which means your blood sugar level is co constantly high. And your insulin is constantly high, storing fat, especially belly fat. Hi. Am I right? Yes. <laughs> um, this is not hot chocolate I'm drinking. Because <laughs> that's bad for you. Um, yeah. So, um, where was I at, Mom? Now I can't remember. Okay, so with chronic stress, you, the, these parts of your body are staying high all the time. So now you are having a lot of belly fat being produced. You're uh, increasing your risk for diabetes, hypertension, all of those things. Anything else? What part of the brain tells your body to release insulin? The hypothalamus. Hypothalamus. Dang it. I was going to say hypothalamus. <laughs> yeah. Because it actually causes... Hypothalamus produces... Hypothalamus tells your brain to release norepinephrine. Norepinephrine tells your pancreas to release insulin. There you go. And... I told them we'd ask you. Okay. Well, there you go. Um, I took her physiology class, but it was almost 20 years ago now. It <laughs> In this classroom, too. Yeah. That table. This table? Yeah. That seat. Right there. 20 years ago. All the memories. Okay, let's see. What else have we not talked about? Um, let's talk about all this. Talk about the gut lining. Liver. All right, so we haven't talked about, I mentioned that the fat cells make some problematic chemicals. They also make good ones, which we'll talk about. Um, but fat cells, especially, maybe only, what do brown fat cells produce? They know about just heat. Yeah, okay. So the white fat cells are the ones that produce all these chemicals. Um, so there's a whole slew of them. These are the bad ones. Um, so this, this fat one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now I become self-conscious because you're shaking. <laughs> um, these these make you. Um, <laughs> these I do. My mother's 83 and she still does. <laughs> That's why I didn't bring her. <laughs> I'm like teaching and both of you staring at me. It's just gonna be too much. Um, so the statin causes the uptake of glucose and fat storage. The uptake of glucose is good, but obviously the fat storage is not great. So it acts in a way that's similar to insulin. Uh, resistant impairs insulin action and promotes inflammation. What is inflammation? Swelling. It's the healing process of the body. Um, but long term, there's all sorts of side effects. Just like cortisol, right? Short term, great. Long term, really bad to have this system constantly activated. Um, so in, an inflammation is like if you cut yourself or you have a splinter, it becomes red and swollen and hot and everything. So now imagine that happening throughout your entire body. Imagine that happening in your organs, right? That's not, not a great thing to happen. Um, RBP4, um, higher levels are correlated with the insulin resistance, and metabolic syndrome. Um, some symptoms increase BMI, waist to hip ratio, all these things we've talked about that are obviously awful. Um, and then TNF-alpha and MCP-1 also promote inflammation. So the more white fat cells you have, the more inflammation you're going to have. That's the biggest side effect of them. Um, and that's going to cause all sorts of nasty side effects in your body. The other thing white fat cells will do is produce estrogen. Um, so anybody have polycystic ovarian syndrome or 
um, any infertility issues, you don't have to raise your hand. But if you have any of those, then it could be from being overweight. So the more, the more obese you are, the more fertility issues you're going to have because of that. And obviously the inflammation is not good too. It does make good chemicals. Um, Appellant? Is that how you say that? Yeah. Controls blood pressure, also promotes angiogenesis. Um, adipo, oh, I know this one. Adiponectin, right? Promotes fat burning and higher metabolic rate, which is obviously something that we really want. Um, leptin is a really important one. Leptin suppresses your appetite. Ghrelin increases it and also makes you irritable, which is why you get hangry. Leptin does the opposite. So it makes you burn things faster, increases your metabolic rate, and also makes you want to eat less. So you want to have leptin. Now you can also get something called leptin resistance. Have you talked about that at all? So it's the same thing as insulin resistance. Your cells start to become resistant to constantly being activated by leptin. Because of course if you're obese, you're producing lots of leptin. And now you become resistant to it, and now you are hungry all the time. Which sucks. And your metabolic rate slows down. So you got double whammy there. Okay, so these are beneficial, but the benefits actually become lost if you are too overweight. So if you have too much fat, then some of them will stop being produced, or the production lowers. Um, like adiponectin and leptin will decrease their production if you have too much fat. So there's like um, a feedback loop that tells your fat cells to stop producing those. Okay? And then of course you become leptin resistant on top of it, and now you're, you're in a mess. So the more overweight you are, the harder it is to lose weight, which sucks. Okay. Um, some other issues with inflammation, chronic in inflammation, can damage your DNA, which can result in cancer cells. Um, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I think we talked about everything there. Um, and there's all sorts of other issues, coronary heart disease, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, stroke, liver and gallbladder disease, sleep apnea. Um, so, yeah, being obese is not great. Now, on the other hand, by the way, being too skinny is also really bad for you as well. As a matter of fact, research shows that being too skinny is worse than being too fat. So if you have to pick one, being nice and fluffy is better for you. <laughs> um, yeah, osteoarthritis, fertility issues. Um, do you want me talking about the rest of this stuff? Not really. No? Okay. <laughs> You missed the interesting stuff. We talked about epigenetics and insulin resistance. Yeah. Did you record it? Cold shock? Yeah. Cold yeah. shock? Cold shock. I told him to go jump in an icy lake. So that you can find it. <laughs> That's a great thing for a teacher to tell you. Go right. jump in a lake. Don't jump in a lake. Yeah. This sort of is talking about some of the psychological yeah. stuff, too. So here's an interesting thing. Early puberty and eating disorders um, are more likely to result in obesity. Um, and it goes the other way around where obesity can also cause those things. So from a psychological standpoint, the earlier you hit puberty as a female, actually this is gender specific, the earlier a female hits puberty, the more psychological problems it causes for her. She's more likely to get bullied, she's more self-conscious about her body. Um, men, boys, the later they hit puberty, the more psychological side effects there are. And those are associated, depression is associated with obesity. Now, it's really hard, remember, this is like the motto of psychology, correlation is not causation. You guys heard that? Okay. So these things are correlated, it's hard to say what's causing it. Is early puberty and the psychological effects causing people to, causing girls at least to be overweight, or was there something that caused the early puberty that caused them to be overweight? And we know that that's the, the case. So like all the plastic we're exposed to. Like I took my grandma out to lunch and she wanted a hot chocolate. Um, obviously we all like hot chocolate in this family. Um, but she, And I thought, oh, I'll get one, but it was in a styrofoam cup. Nope. Suddenly, if it involves that, I have self-control. Uh, because when plastics, and styrofoam is a plastic, heats up, it leaches out all sorts of toxins, including xeno, xenoestrogens. Xeno is a Latin term meaning foreign. Um, so, uh, like if you're a xenophobe, you don't like foreigners. So, um, xenoestrogens, <laughs> it's, it's a real word. Uh, I didn't make it up. <laughs> Talk to like ancient Latin speakers. Um, so, 
Xenoestrogens act like estrogen in the body, but they're not truly estrogen, but they act the same way. So now you have artificially raised levels of estrogen, so you could be, if you're a man that drinks too much hot chocolate and styrofoam, you could get man parts and... Can I say that in school? Man breasts. Man breasts. There you go. <laughs> I don't call it but um, so you can have that. Women will start puberty early. She had a student years ago now who came to her and said she's really concerned. Her daughter started her period. She doesn't know what to do. And I remember you said to her, well, honey, your little girls will start their period eventually. That happens. She goes, yeah, but she's five years old. <gasps> what? Five years old. So all of the toxins and the hormones in, be in meat, also in milk, were, were, used to be issues. They don't do that as much anymore. Um, but still, the plastic exposure will cause stuff like that to happen. Um, the receipts you get from the store, those are coated in bisphenol A, BPA, which we all know, hopefully by now, that that's really bad for you. Um, and they did an experiment where people held it for 30 seconds, and they measured the BPA in the body, and it had skyrocketed. 30 seconds. So imagine those poor people working at the grocery stores who are handling that stuff all day long. And that has all sorts of negative side effects, inflammation, fertility issues, so Would you on. even touch a receipt? I won't touch a receipt. <laughs> I'll hold out a bag and I'll say, just drop it in. Or I'll say, I don't want a receipt. And they look at me like I'm crazy. Like, I do not want it. No. Yeah. Big plastics? <laughs> if plastic is warm or aged, it will release the same chemicals. Yes. By the way, Dawn soap or any commercial dish washing soaps also are full of xenoestrogens. Um, you soup, right? You think, oh, I'll pour it out of the can. It won't be exposed to anything. It's fine. Glass bowl. I'm doing good. Um, no, it has a plastic lining in that can, and that is heated up intensely in order to make sure any bacteria in it is killed. So those things are full of toxins. If you ever drank your water bottle and it tasted gross after being in your hot car? Those are all the chemicals that leached into it. That's why it tastes gross. Yeah. You guys are like, hey. Yeah. <laughs> 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 all my turf coming today. <laughs> <laughs> Should I show this? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Look that up on YouTube. That's a good one. Yeah, so huge amounts of inflammation and everything. Yeah. Don't even get me started on vaccines. Yeah. So, we, <laughs> so we shouldn't drink out of a plastic water bottle? No. You should buy a glass one or a steel one. Aluminum's okay too if you're not doing hot liquids. But yeah. There's some studies that suggest aluminum has a stays in your brain cells and can create Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. What about the plastic water bottles that like BPA free? Oh, BPA free plastic water bottles. I thought that was wonderful when they first came out too. But evidently they replace BPA with other chemicals that are even worse than BPA. Awesome. I threw away all of mine. There's no, not a single Tupperware bowl in my house or plastic water bottle. Yeah, doesn't happen. Yeah. So what were you going to say about vaccines? <laughs> we argue sure. about vaccines. Go so. for it. Just go well, for it. Well, I'm just concerned. Now, granted, I don't have any children, but I like them, so I've been researching this. Um, that's kind of a weird person. Um, so vaccines, there's, there is some very controversial research out there done by FDA, I think? Is it F no, no, yeah, FDA, Food and Drug, um, that shows that there's a correlation with autism and other physical issues. However, that was hush-hush research that allegedly they altered before publication. And there was a person who was one of the researchers on the team who came out and said, we lied about this, here's the actual research. Um, and it does show a correlation to autism. Now there's also research that has shown that glyphosate, which is the pesticide Roundup, which is used tremendously throughout our country, is associated, glyphosate um, exposure is associated with autism and of course tons of other issues. Um, and then there's a, another study that was done in Germany that said 90% of vaccines they tested had glyphosate in it. It's so, a preservative. Preservative, yeah. yeah. So, and of course, I mean, there's mercury in it, there's, I mean, there's all sorts of other toxins that we put in vaccines and then we say that it's fine, it shouldn't cause any side effects. So, does it? I don't know, but it's, it scares me. Of course, mumps and polio scares me too, so, you know, measles don't scare me, but she, she said, well, I had it five times, I can tell you it's terrible, but you had it five times and you didn't die. So I was lucky, yes. <laughs> there were other children that I knew that did, 
Yeah, one in a thousand now it's on the statistics. So but then I'm also the type of person who say, I don't care if my children walk home. If, you know, they need to learn to be careful and not be kidnapped or anything. No. I do when I pick up my niece and nephew. Yes. I drop them off about a mile away from home and tell them walk the rest of the way. I do. They need to learn how to do it. It's good for them. Yeah. Probably not my idea now. Why the Because there's multiple bobcats in the neighborhood. What is a bobcat? The bobcat is going to run away. Just don't tell the kid because the kid's more afraid of anybody else. Constantly bringing the dog in. Leave the dogs outside. The bobcat is not going to kill that dog. Um, okay. So, uh, genetically, obviously we talked about genetics, there's epigenetics, um, but some people are just born lucky with good genetics. So there's the thrifty genotype hypothesis. Some people are born with genes that help their ancestors to survive. Now that sounds like it should be good, and it is if you're in a family. Okay? But if you are in an abundant world with everything at your fingertips, you don't need to be the person who to eats one little piece of prison loaf and you put on 20 pounds. Okay? If this was a famine, that would be great. Um, but we haven't had a famine in quite some time since, I don't know, what, the 30s probably? We haven't had a famine in this country. I actually thought about moving to Ireland once, and that was the biggest thing that scared me, because they have had famines constantly. The, the biggest famine killed a million people in that country. So yeah. I probably have thrifty genotypes because I'm not Irish, but whatever. Um, so yeah, if your ancestry is comes from a line that had lots of famine, then you probably will have a thrifty genotype. Now there is research that says this is baloney, and there's research that says this is true. So it's hard to say, but it's probably true. But it's so there's so many other things that complicate it, like your epigenetics, that it's hard to really say for sure if that is causing the issues. Um, oh yeah, one of the pieces of evidence is adoption studies. So you adopt a kid into your family, and you all have the thrifty genotypes, so you're all obese, but then you have a skinny rail person who eats the same thing as you, has the same stress you are under, and so on. So why is that one person skinny and you're not? Again, probably the genetics, but also probably the epigenetics that they were had passed down to them. We have found genes that are associated with obesity. If you do your 23andMe, you'll find out if you have it or not. Um, so, so, in some cases, um, th there's one specific gene that they have found associated with obesity, but most of the research suggests that there are lots, there's probably hundreds of different genes that are creating <coughs> obesity in people. Okay, so it's not one thing that we can just put our finger on. Okay. Um, so, let's see, what is that saying? So, six new alleles, an allele is like a section of DNA, associated with BMI were identified. 1% um, of people harboring the most obesity causing allele, I like how that is harboring, it's very like cut through. Um, we're, all, we're an average of 10 pounds heavier, um, and 1% of the individual with the fewest of these alleles was only 4 pounds heavier than a typical person. So obviously there is a pretty strong correlation between weight gain and genetics, but it's not, it. like if you're 10 pounds overweight, you can say, well, it's my genetics. If you're more than that, then it's probably not just the genetics. Um, however, I am definitely not somebody who subscribes to the theory that you just don't have self-control, and so that's why you're fat. There are certainly people out there like that, but most of it is that whole cascade, that whole cycle we've been talking about with all of this feedback of toxins and xenoestrogens and insulin resistance and the epigenetics our parents passed down from eating crappy. Thank you, Mom. Um, no, more like thank your mom. Yeah, oh, yes. <laughs> My grandma is the worst eater in the world. So if I have that epigenetics, it's because of her. McDonald's every day. Every day. Coke for breakfast. I've eaten up more in the last week that she's been visiting with us than probably the last six months or year, maybe. I don't know. It's been a lot. Um, yesterday, she, we went out twice. My mother would eat fast food for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks. And snacks. And dessert. <laughs> Don't forget dessert. <laughs> and there has to be dessert with every meal, and that includes breakfast. <laughs> we were raised with cake for breakfast. Yeah. So I have crappy food <laughs> All right. Um, Oh, you do have something on leptin resistance. Great. So we talked about that. So <clears throat> leptin is produced by the fat cells. 
um, is proportional to the total amount of fat in the body. Um, when fat cells are, when fat stores are full, so when the cells get full, it releases a surge of leptin, which tells you you're not hungry anymore. So that's what stops us from overeating. However, like I said, if we are too obese, that leptin stops being produced as much. Um, you can also become leptin resistant, and now you don't have that feedback loop telling you now's the time to stop eating. So you continue to eat until you're so full that you're making yourself sick, and then you stop eating because you just can't eat anymore. Um, so, obviously, a really bad feedback loop to have. Um, okay. So, leptin resistance. The brain becomes desensitized to it, no longer depresses appetite. Um, it does not... Now, the, here's the interesting thing that with leptin resistance. Obese people tend to have higher levels of leptin than non-obese people, but it doesn't decrease their appetite because they have developed that leptin resistance. Um, and it's not just because of your fat cells, although your fat cells are what releases it, um, it also is that if you're eating a lot of sugar, grains, processed foods, and so on, um, that causes your fat cells to release an excessive amount of sugar, which if you have leptin, or an excessive amount of leptin, which then feeds back and helps to create leptin resistance. Okay. So, again, those carbs are doing bad things. Um, fasting lowers leptin levels. Very low calorie diet can also, although there are some side effects. Um, the difference between fasting and starvation is if you are in starvation, anybody watch Naked and Afraid? I love that show. I don't know why. Like, I'm a smart person, but I love reality shows. Um, <laughs> it drives her crazy. She's, she walks into the house and she's like, really? There's a naked flat on TV? <laughs> Sorry. Um, the psychological aspect of it is really funny. Uh, so, so when if you watch that show, they're eating, they're not eating a lot, but they're eating little amounts inconsistently, right? That's starvation. And your body knows that starvation versus if you just stop eating entirely. Your body somehow knows this is fasting. So when you're starving, your body goes, holy cow, this is crunch time, we're in trouble. So it immediately slows down your metabolic processes and puts you in starvation mode. If you're fasting, your body goes, oh, okay, this is fasting, and it does not do that to you. So research shows that the metabolic uh, rate does not slow significantly. It slows a little bit, but it does not slow significantly. And it doesn't, the longer you fast, it doesn't continue to go down. It just drops a little bit and then stays pretty level. It's interesting because on that show, uh, we... She has so to you watch it. You gotta sit down and watch this. <laughs> there was one guy who, they're there for how many days? Like 30 21 days. usually. 21 yeah. days. Well, the guy fasted like for... 40 day one or the 21 day? <laughs> <laughs> the guy fasted the whole 21 days. Yeah. And he didn't eat anything the whole and time he, he was there. And barely lost any weight. Yeah. And you watch these other people who basically mm -hmm. they'll eat a little and starve and eat a little and starve. And they'll lose 20, 30 pounds. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how the difference between yeah. the two. Yeah, so our body was designed to be able to fast and to be able to fast in a healthy manner. Starvation doesn't spare protein, so it will eat your muscles up really fast, which you see on that show. If you fast, your body does different chemical processes that spare your muscles. And so you generally, even with a long-term fast, you generally lose very little fat. Um, the longest fast in the world, now this was under medical supervision, he was given vitamins and so on, um, but it was over a year, the longest fast. Me yeah. You can believe that. He was a very obese person. I think he was like 600 pounds. And he went on a year-long fast and did not eat for a year. And obviously, like I said, he had minerals and vitamins and stuff. But, yeah. So, and he did not lose muscle. His body spared, or didn't even lose a lot, I should say. Um, so, yeah. Interesting, right? Um, so, um, another experiment was done on poor mice. They were treated with leptin alone, leptin with insulin, um, or leptin, wait, what am I saying here? Yeah. So they were treated with leptin alone or leptin with insulin, and both of those caused low blood sugar, lower cholesterol, less body fat. Oh, no, okay, I said it right there. So those treated with leptin alone had lower blood sugar, lower cholesterol, and less body fat than those treated with insulin alone. Um, so leptin alone or leptin with insulin is better than insulin alone. Um, so this may be a great new treatment for diabetes and weight loss. 
you don't just give people insulin, but you also give them leptin. Um, there's issues with both of those, because obviously both of them could create resistance, right, if you raise the levels in your body. But if, if you're diabetic, and you're the type of diabetic that you're not producing any insulin, um, then that may actually be really helpful to add leptin to the regime. Um, there is a genetic mutation um, that you don't produce leptin, and so you are constantly hungry, constantly severe. This is like the Twinkie thing, right? So if you hear about cases where you, there's like these children that won't stop eating, um, this is where the Twinkie defense comes from. You guys heard of that? There's a little girl. No, that was a different case. That was a guy. Twinkie defense. Yeah. Um, but there have, there's been like there was a little girl who died from eating Twinkies. She ate a huge amount of them, and she was gigantic. She's like six years old and 500 pounds or something. Um, and the reason is because she did not have the gene to produce leptin. You also had a student in your class with this, right? And she was hungry constantly, did not matter how much she ate. And she had a wonderful family. She was very lucky. And they would come in every once in a while. They, somebody would come into the classroom and just whisper to her and leave. And she told her that um, they were coming in to say, you can do it. I know you're hungry, but you can do this. And so every single day throughout the day, they schedule people to come and give her encouragement to not eat. Otherwise, she would be, she'd eat herself to death. Because imagine never being full. Imagine being as hungry as you ever are, and then you're always like that. That's it's terrible. Yeah, terrible condition. Um, sometimes it can be treated with recombinant human leptin. Um, that's one study that's shown that, but the study's kind of inclusive, in, inconclusive. Um, so... I don't know if it's possible. Um, I talked about ghrelin, that's the hunger hormone that makes you hangry. It's produced by the cells in the stomach and the pancreas. The levels increase before a meal and decrease after the meal, which is helpful. I dated a guy with the worst ghrelin issues in the known universe once. I guess he did. He could go two hours without food. Maybe. 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 If we ever went anywhere, we had to pack, and we had to plan, how long are we going to be gone, how much food do you need, holy cow, if he did not get food. We actually went on a little trip, how many hours were we driving, maybe an hour and a half, before he actually had to pull over to the side of the road and bring out an entire meal and eat it yes. before we could drive on. And she tested his glucose, what's the honey test called? This is his glucose, glucose tolerance. Tolerance test, yeah. And, um, he had metabolized all his sugar within 45 minutes? No, less than that. It was within yeah. about 15. Yeah. But the man was also all solid muscle. And no fat. There was almost... I think it was no, like negative body fat. Yeah. I, I've never, ever seen anybody with so little body fat ever and be such a healthy person. And so he had so much muscle that... And his muscle had such a high metabolism that it would just eat all of his energy stores just like that. And the guy and his would go went crazy if he did not get food. Oh, yes. <laughs> it was bad. I thought, if, if we don't feed him, he's going to literally murder someone. It was terrible. We were planning on a camping trip. And um, we said to him, if we run out of food, what are you going to do? And he said, he, he will leave us behind, and he will go hike back to the car, and he will get food. And we're like, mm, no. not going. No. And then I think I broke up with him pretty soon after yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> like, you're going to leave me behind? No way. No, this is the end of that. All right. <laughs>